I'm in northern India on the banks of the Ganges in the holy city of Varanasi. This is one of the oldest inhabited places on earth and like Rome or Jerusalem, it serves as a kind of cosmic center for India's one billion Hindus. Behind this image of religious harmony, India faces a crisis. Minorities, including over 200 million Muslims, fear an underlying current of violence, mob brutality and death at the hands of Hindu hardliners. And it mirrors the rise of the so-called Hindutva or Hindu nationalist politics and of India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, along with its leader Narendra Modi. Article 370 This is a deeply religious country in the middle of a battle for her soul. And it is no surprise that it was this place that the Hindu nationalist leader Narendra Modi chose as his election battleground, repurposing its powerful symbolism in a new time. My name is Atish Tasir. I'm a writer and a columnist. I live in New York but was raised in New Delhi, the capital of India, by my Indian mother. My strange father was a politician from Pakistan. Despite this mixed heritage, I'm passionate about India, the country I love and will always consider to be home. But in a recent article I wrote criticizing Prime Minister Modi for his policies on Muslims, and other minorities, political leaders attacked me as a foreigner, wrongly calling me a Muslim and a Pakistani. I'm neither, with no right to interfere in Indian affairs. With minorities under attack and criticism of the Prime Minister now seen as an affront to the nation itself, freedom of speech is becoming a dangerous thing. I've returned home to see for myself what life is like for India's minorities in this land of one and a quarter billion people. मुस्लिम कर दिया जहाँ भी हिंदू मुसलमान थे वहीं जय श्री राम बोलो जबरदस्ती जय श्री राम बुलवाते हैं मार देते हैं। I'll meet with the unfortunate victims of violence on the streets। पांच छह बंदे थे, तो उनके पास हथियार भी था, तो उन्होंने पकड़ लिया उसको और उसको जान से मार दिया। I'll meet with the vigilantes who go out at night to hunt down cow smugglers। काय को कोई चोट मारे बहुत पीड़ा होती है। I'll hear from Hindus who support the Modi government's pro-Hindu agenda. Hindu is waking up to get back the birthplaces of his ancestors. And from those who don't. Well, Hindutva is actually reducing the great philosophical majesty uh, of, of the Hindu faith into something more like the team identity of the British football hooligan. I want to know once and for all, is India the inclusive secular country I grew up in, safe for Muslims and other minorities, or is it on a journey to become a Hindu-dominated nation? And one that's a danger to itself. We're approaching one of the most historically contentious places in India. So you see the white mosque there? That was built by the Emperor Aurangzeb, and it sits on the bones of an old temple, which was really the holy of holies in this city. It was Hinduism's most important temple, the Kashi Vishwanath, that the 17th century Mughal ruler Aurangzeb had destroyed, building this, the Gyanvapi Mosque, on its ruins. 
A smaller version of the temple, dedicated to the Hindu deity Shiva, was built in the shadow of the mosque that sits on the bones of the original temple. You can see the temple with its gold spire. Really, they were making up for the fact that the sanctum sanctorum of the city had been torn down, had been destroyed. In destroying their holiest temple, Aurangzeb had dealt Hindus a humiliating blow, one that's still keenly felt today. Muslim invaders came here, not only to rule this place, but to make conversion at a large scale. They killed lakhs of people. They destroyed la lakhs of temples here, simply to build mosque or that place so that they will feel ashamed of themselves. Lord Shiva came there. And it was considered as sacred as Makkah for Muslims and Jerusalem for Isais and for Christians. Why this temple was removed? These were removed simply to hurt the Hindu sentiments. This violent history has local Muslims fearing the mosque may be attacked. But centuries on, why are Muslims in their landmarks under threat now? In recent years, a wave of Hindu hardliners have attacked religious minorities, mainly Muslims. It's a form of mob violence known as cow vigilantism, aimed at the trade in cattle. Cows are sacred to Hindus, but India is a major beef and leather exporter. The sale, slaughter and consumption of cows, mainly by Muslims in the lower caste, puts them at odds with Hindus who take offense. These cow vigilantes are patrolling the state border between Rajasthan and Haryana in northwest India. They're on the trail of cow smugglers. Different states have different laws on cow trading and slaughter, which traffickers take advantage of. This is a known smuggling point. In recent months, the vigilantes have intercepted several trucks here with cows on board. जब तक जीवन में आस है और जब तक हमारे एक एक खून में नसों के अंदर एक एक खून का कतरा दौड़ेगा तब तक हम गो रक्षा करते रहेंगे हम गो रक्षा से कभी मुंह नहीं पोड़ेंगे In July 2018 Rakhbar Khan a Muslim cattle trader was attacked by cow vigilantes as he led a small herd of cows along a rural track A few hours later he was dead I've traveled to Rakhbar's village in Nu in the state of Haryana to meet his family. Suleiman ji, we want to know what your story is. We have killed him in the house. We have killed him in the house. Yes, his name is that he was the Rakhbar. तो जब वापसी गाय लेके आ रहा था घर की तरफ तो लगभग वो रात का टाइम था बारे एक बजे का उस टाइम पांच छह बंदे थे तो उनके पास हथियार भी था तो उन्होंने पकड़ लिया उसको और उसको जान से मार दिया उस लगभग वो बारे हड्डियां उसकी टूट चुकी थी उसको इतना मारा था और कौन थे ये लोग लल्ला लगभग तीन तो अरेस्ट कर ले तीन बाकी हैं वो अभी यूं ही घूम रहे हैं और आपको कैसे पता है कि इन छह लोगों ने की है ये हमारे जो हुआ के साथ लड़का था दूसरे लड़का दूसरा अच्छा अच्छा तो उन्होंने उसे साथ उसने उसको मारता भी देखा है पांव तोड़ता भी देखा है जैसी भी नौबत हुई वो वो लड़का एक खेत था उसके अंदर वो खाली खेत था उसके अंदर कोई फसल नहीं थी 
तो वो उसके अंदर भाग पड़ा जो असलम था वो पीछे था वो उनको दिखाई नहीं दिया जैसे उन्होंने फायरिंग की तो वहाँ एक कपास का खेत था लगभग उसमें इतना बड़ा चार फिट के लगभग कपास था उस टाइम तो वो क्या हुआ कपास के खेत में पड़ गया तो वहाँ से वो उसको पीटने में लग गए रकबर को तो उसने नाम सुने थे वो आपस में कर रहे थे ना कि भाई नवल इसका पैर तोड़ दे सुरेश इसके हाथ तोड़ दे तो वो सुन रहा था वो सारी बातें वहाँ से और मैंने ये भी सुना है कि गाय तक सीमित नहीं रहा है कि कोई बकरे के साथ भी घूम रहा है तो उन्हें तंग करते हैं जी बकरे के साथ भी हो रहा है बकरे के साथ अगर घूम रहे हैं तो फिर भी हो रहा है लेकिन वो फिर होता है तो फिर मुसलमान के नाम पे होता है फिर गाय का मैटर खत्म हो गया फिर वो हिंदू मुसलमान वाला मैटर बन जाता है और ये इसका मकसद क्या है यहाँ से मुसलमानों को खत्म किया जाए एक हिंदू राष्ट्रवाद इसको बनाना चाहिए ये सियासत चल रही है यहाँ पूरे देश के अंदर ही चल रही है The vigilantes we met earlier talked us through what happened to Rakhbar. They claim he was attempting to smuggle cows across the state border between Rajasthan and Haryana. They told us in Rajasthan the trade in cows for meat is far stricter than in neighboring Haryana. They took us to the field where Rakhbar was attacked. Ye seedhi idhar se yon aati hai. Yahan se nikal ke seedhe jo samne jo ped dikh raha hai, wahan se seedhe le jaate hain border pe. Aage kya hai ki aage musalmanon ke gaon hain. Wahan unko संरक्षण मिलता है संरक्षण मिलता है सेफ्टी मिलती है किसानों ने जैसे कि उनको देखा भाई हमारी फसल ये तोड़ रहे हैं रोज गाय को यहाँ से ले जा रहे हैं पशुओं को गायों को ले जा रहे हैं यहाँ से तो उन्होंने उनको पकड़ा होगा फिर उन्होंने हल्ला किया हल्ला करने किया हल्ला करने के बाद जाके पुलिस को यहाँ लेके आए दिस पिक्चर ऑफ रखबर वॉज टेकन बाई विजी बिफोर द पुलिस टू खेम ही वॉज इन पुलिस कास्टडी फॉर ओवर थ्री आवर्स When they delivered him to a community health center, he was dead. Rakhbar yahan se zinda diya tha. Ab ye to hame to kya malum ki is kaise maut hui? 1 baje unko de diya. 4 baje tak 3:30 4 baje tak kya karte rahe uske sath? Kahan leke gaye usko? Kya kiya uske sath? Ab hame koi malum nahi iske bare. Rakhbar was just one of dozens of Muslim men attacked in the last few years for trading in cattle. Pelu Khan was a cattle trader who was lynched as he transported cows through the town of Behror in the state of Rajasthan in northwestern India. He and a few others were dragged from the vehicles where they were beaten by a mob. All of our gods live in cow. It is our faith. A cow is considered sacred by entire Hindu society. It is not a matter of eating habits. It is a matter of respecting the faith, respecting the law of land. I cannot ask for uh, pig's meat in Muslim countries. Why they can ask for beef in India? Cow protection is. right from the beginning a duty of hindus of this country and we have got lots of fights to save six men were put on trial for the murder of pehlu khan 
All of them were acquitted due to insufficient evidence. Following state elections in 2018, the Congress party replaced the BJP in Rajasthan. They passed an anti-lynching law and launched an appeal against the judgment. We're in the state of Uttar Pradesh in northern India. I'm curious to hear the views of traders at this cattle market. जबरदस्ती पकड़ के ऐसा कहा जाएगा तो तो गलत है ना अगर ये ऐसे चलता रहा हिंदू मुस्लिम का फसाद हो जाएगा झगड़ा हो जाएगा आपस में हमारे हिंदुस्तान में एक ऐसा शासन बनाया जाए ऐसा कानून बनाया जाए जिससे मिलजुल के सब रहे जैसे पहले सदियों से चलता आ रहा था अब क्या है जब से मोदी की सरकार जब से मोदी की सरकार आई जब से हिंदू मुस्लिम या जातिवाद का ज्यादा वो होने लगा because the cow is holy in Hinduism, that suddenly the whole cattle trade has been weaponized. They were recounting incidents throughout the country where cattle has been used to target Muslims. Finally, when I said to them, are you afraid? They said, yes, there's terrible fear among the community and we don't know what the future will look like, that if it continues in this way, it could be a really turbulent, very disrupted future between two communities that have lived next door to each other for centuries. I was struck by the fears the cattle traders were confiding in me. I wondered how ordinary Hindus saw things. BJP आने के बाद मोदी आने के बाद के लोगों के बीच में तनाव बढ़ गया। ओ सर ये अब आयुध जाके देखिए कितना अच्छा हम लोग का बैठता है या कितना अच्छा हम लोग का तालमेल चल रहा है। अब देखिए जब से मोदी आया तब से कोई दंगा हुआ यहाँ पे। आपकी नजरों में इन ये BJP सरकार से मुसलमानों को कोई खतरा नहीं है? All Indian agree हैं BJP से। Yes। कि मुस्लि� from what we've been hearing uh, from Muslims, and it's very convincing, but there you have it. Uttar Pradesh is India's most populous state. There are 44 million Muslims amongst its population of over 230 million. Its chief minister is Yogi Adityanath, a prominent figure in Hindutva or Hindu nationalist politics. To many, he's a divisive figure, and he's behind a youth movement accused of involvement in communal violence. He maintains that today's problems are the result of hundreds of years of conflict. In a 2015 speech, he reportedly said it was his intention to place statues of Hindu gods in every mosque. I wanted to talk to him about his views on Muslims and the beef and cattle trade. He declined my interview request. But his biographer and political analyst, Shantanu Gupta, is willing to talk to us. It's a kind of clash of civilizations, right? A civilization which came from outside, it broke your temples, it burned your libraries, it, it destroyed your social education systems. Right. India is still coming terms to it. If he wants to see historical justice done on behalf of the Hindus, what would that justice look like? What would he like to see happen? The ideology which the BJP represents, I think they will want the 
ancient Indian knowledge to be respected. Second is not celebrating these kind of harsh rulers. And what Aurangzeb did with Sikhs, everyone knows, like heads cut, uh, hung there. It's almost like I come to your house, I destroy your whole house, and you name your house after my name. This kind of history occurred all over the world. But do, do, do you have a road called Hitler Road anywhere? No, I, I have I, never seen, I've traveled it, quite a lot. In a cattle market in Meerut, I stopped at a tea house where the owner is a former slaughterhouse worker. If you want to go back to the ghost line, it's not possible. It means that now everything is closed. We will start working again. तो मतलब कि आप ये चाय की दुकान एक मजबूरी की चीज़ मजबूरी की चीज़ है जब कोई काम नहीं मिला तो हमने काम कर लिया और दोनों कोमों के बीच में हिंदू मुस्लिम के बीच में तनाव है या दिक्कतें हैं या ना कोई तनाव तो ऐसी बात कोई तनाव वाली सब कुछ पूरा मन है कुछ ऐसा तो है थोड़ा बहुत है और योगी सरकार की तरफ से आप बुराइयां कर रहे हैं या मतलब कि वो उन्हें चोट पहुंचाने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं या वो अच्छी तरह हकुमत चला रहे हैं कारोबारी नहीं चलने दे रहे इस तरह और कमीला वाला खुलने नहीं दे रहे भाई हजारों आदमी बेरोजगार हैं और आप उसमें काम कर रहे थे? हम काम और बिजनेस का हमारा अपना मीट का मीट का था और जब भोजपुर कमेला शिफ्ट किया तो उसमें कुछ कारण बता के उन्होंने वो कमेला बंद कराया वो जो बना था वो चालू नहीं हुआ अपनी तो आपकी नजरों में इन्होंने ये क्यों किया? ये तो हिंदू मुस्लिम होने के नाते भेद भाव जो कुर्बानी के लिए पशु ला रहे हैं वो पकड़ पकड़ के बंद कर रहे हैं ऊंट बंद है मेरे बंद है ये कुर्बानी के लिए आए हुए हैं क्या किया था हमने डीएम से परमिशन ली थी ऊंटों के लिए परमिशन मिली सभी विभागों में हमारी एप्लीकेशन गई थी पहली तारीख में हमने ऊंट मंगाई है बिक्री के लिए यहाँ पर कुर्बानी के लिए और पहली तारीख की शाम को कप्तान साहब ने आदेश कर दिया कि ऊँट की कुर्बानी नहीं की जाएगी तो इसकी वजह से आपको कैसा नुकसान पहुंचाया जाएगा? कैसा मैं नुकसान झेलना पड़ेगा? नुकसान ये झेलना पड़ेगा मैं कारोबारी आदमी था आज मैं मजदूरी कर रहा हूँ पार्किंग पे पैसे घोर रहा हूँ खड़ा होकर एक ऊंट की कीमत कितनी है? वो भी एक ऊंट की कीमत लगभग 50 60 70 In a country like India, it's often hard to know for sure if this is the whole story. But it's clear that people feel that they are being persecuted. Mohammad Ishtiag Ansari is one of many casualties of the Yogi government, a man of business reduced to penury overnight. Thousands like him have been affected in the state of Uttar Pradesh. And even before this festival of Eid, there is a sense of fear and trepidation. But hardliners, be they vigilantes or politicians, are not merely obsessed with protecting cows. I'm Atish Tasir. I'm in India on a journey of discovery. I want to know once and for all, is India the inclusive, secular country I grew up in, safe for Muslims and other minorities, or is it on a path to become a Hindu-dominated nation? I've come to see Vijay Kant Chauhan, a so-called anti-love jihad warrior. 
His movement claims to be thwarting Muslim men who pretend to be Hindus so as to seduce Hindu girls and force them to convert to Islam. लेकिन सो में से सो परसेंट केसों में वो जब मिलते हैं अपना नाम झूठ बोलते हैं सोनू मोनू या हिंदू बताते हैं आप अगर प्रेम करते थे हिंदुस्तानी से अपना नाम छुपाने क्या जरूरत है आपको आपको ये माथे पर टिक्का लगाने की जरूरत है आपको ये कलावा पहनने की जरूरत है हिंदू लोग पहनने की जरूरत है आप अगर सच्चा प्रेम करते हैं आपके आप झूठ बोल के प्रेम करेंगे तो आपको कैसे पता लग गया कि उन्होंने इस असली किया ना धोखा दिया आपको कैसे इसका यकीन हो सकता है सो में से अस्सी परसेंट लड़कियाँ धोखे के शिकार हमें खुद फोन कर दी हैं अब लड़कियाँ फोन कर लड़कियाँ फोन कर दी हैं कि हमें जानकारी नहीं दी इन्होंने इसी तरह मेरे घर में आए मेरे पापा से मिले मेरे भाई से मिले मेरे भाई के दोस्त बन गया हमारे घर में कुछ व्यापार को हल्का था उसमें सहयोग किया काम करने लगे और धीरे में बातें करते करते हमारी जो दोस्ती होगी फ्रेंडशिप होगी मैं एक बार नार दी मेरी इन्होंने वीडियो बना ली वीडियो बना के मुझे वहाँ बुलाया मौके पर ब्लैकमेल किया मुझे अब ये मुझे कहते हैं मुस्लिम बनो मेरे साथ वहाँ चलो बाहर चलो ऐसी सैकड़ों लड़कियाँ हमें खुद मेरे मेरे हेल्पलाइन नंबर से वो बटे पूछा यहाँ इफ यू By a disguised name, in most of the cases, like a name like a Bunty or a Lovely, which does not tell you are you Hindu or a Muslim, you go and woo a Hindu girl, and then you marry her and you convert her in the process. In the process, you will get a high seat in your local local mosque. You have converted a kafir into the right 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 stream of 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 God, which is Islam. But that's that is love jihad. One might be forgiven for dismissing the anti-love jihadis. as being paranoid but in uttar pradesh the chief minister yogi adityanath has endorsed their activities adding fuel to the fire meri nani ji aur mere nana ji mere dada ji aksar ye kahani hame bataya karte the meri nani khud swayam jab batwara hua tha batwara ke waqt lasho ke dher mein lete ke apni gardan pe khoon laga ke blood laga ke zinda bach gayi unko dikha ke ki hum mar chuke hain वो सारा दर्द होना लगा था एक मंडी थी वहाँ पे मंडी के अंदर पूरी मंडी को चार सौ घेर लिया जितने वहाँ बुजुर्ग थे माता थे उनके पिता थे सब मार दिया उनकी बेटियाँ सब उठा के ले गए वहाँ से इस तरह बच गया है वहाँ से वो सारे संस्मरण वो सारे दर्द वो सारी पीड़ा हमारे दिलो दिमाग में हमेशा रहती है जय श्री राम जैसे आप अभी तलवार देखा रहे हैं आपके पास बंदूक भी है आप किस हद तक जाने के लिए तैयार हैं जब मरने को तैयार हैं मिट्टी को तैयार हैं मारने को तैयार हैं आपकी नजरों में आपको कानून अपने हाथों में लेना चाहिए मैं कानून हाथ में नहीं लेना चाहता लेकिन हमें मजबूर किया जाता है मजबूर करा जाएगा तो हम कानून हाथ में लेने को तैयार हैं I was made very very uncomfortable by that experience He seemed in many ways like a local lunatic. Things that he talks about, love jihad. Um, oh, he said that he wanted to intern in, in Indian Muslims the way it was done in Uyghur China. These things have have had a broad currency in these last four or five years under the Modi government and especially under the chief ministership of Yogi Adityanath. So there's this there's this kind of a real apprehension in me about whether. I'm reporting a kind of opinion that has true validity on the ground, or whether I'm giving the microphone to a complete lunatic. What isn't in dispute is the anger felt by him. But why do so many like him hold such extreme views? Among frequently cited reasons are the historical actions of some of India's Muslim rulers, the Mughals. Prominent among them are the Emperor Babur who founded the Mughal Empire along with the 17th century ruler Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb ruthlessly put Sikh and other minority leaders to the sword. He was piously orthodox, imposing Islamic law throughout his kingdom, destroying cherished Hindu temples and shrines and building mosques in their place, including at Varanasi, the Holy of Holies, the Kashi Vishwanath Temple. Some dispute his legacy, 
but Aurangzeb remains a hated figure for Hindutva ideologues to seize on. It's easy to struggle with this complexity of layer upon layer of history. To help me navigate this, I've traveled to India's capital, New Delhi, to the Sri Lakshmi Narayan Mandir, which was built in the 1930s. I'm here to discuss this complex history with psychotherapist Rajat Mitra. His recent book, The Infidel Next Door, argues that unless it is resolved, hurt from the past can be carried through to succeeding generations. We've had in the early 90s the destruction of uh, Baba's mosque at the place where Ram was born, yes. and we have a movement for the rebuilding of a temple. So what is your feeling about what should happen in these sites? Uh, I think these, these are what uh, we would call sacred spaces. I think one of the deepest griefs that the present Hindu society has yeah. is about the desecration and destruction of their temples. Right. There are memories attached to that. There is a big displacement, a structural displacement taking place in our society. So historical memories are becoming very much alive in India right now. Right. Those memories have not gone in 500 years. They still remain as strong as they were 500 years ago. Hindus to me are not aggressive people. For what has happened is that there have been centuries of denial of their anger, what they have gone through. And I feel that in the present, if their anger is understood, it will lead to a lot of healing. Are you not afraid that, that, that bringing up memory, especially when people are using memory in quite strategic political ways? Memory exists already. It exists as a collective in the society. It is not that I'm bringing it up. The issue is to understand each other. The issue is to sit down, talk, and share that, yes, this is what happened with us, and acknowledge that. Like to quote, for instance, V.S. Naipaul in this, yeah. the past must be acknowledged, but the past also must be seen as dead, that if one stays mired in the past, you can't really move forward. Sure. I, I can't see the past as dead. I would see the past as very much alive. It exists uh, in the form of memories inside us both individual and collective. Hatred is nothing but anger stored inside. Uh, it is important to understand that anger, and if that anger is acknowledged, it dissolves. So I really liked meeting Rajat. I found him super interesting and educated and thoughtful. And I find this idea of transgenerational historical justice and memory fascinating. I guess my concern is how people can be held responsible for the crimes of the past and if they even should be. Rajat Mitra came across as sincere in his call for India's 200 million Muslims to somehow accept blame for the actions of previous generations, even if achieving it in practice seems unworkable. But under the BJP, the state is imposing its own forms of historical redress. So I'm trying to find Aurangzeb Road on Google Maps because I grew up among these streets. But if you type in Aurangzeb Road, you get Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Road. And the reason for that is that Aurangzeb was a Mughal emperor from the 17th century, known for his severity and for his cruelty. And the BJP has taken it upon itself to be an arbiter of who is a good Muslim and who is a bad Muslim. And they've decided that Aurangzeb is a very bad Muslim. And Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, who was the father of India's nuclear program, is a very good Muslim. I grew up with the belief that India's syncretism, the blending of India's unique religious and cultural traditions, are what makes the country so inherently rich. An example of this legacy is the Urdu language, a form of Hindi infused through the centuries with Persian and Arabic influence. I'm in Delhi's old city to visit a friend. He's an Urdu poet, and he has a story to tell about how the language, along with the culture, is under threat. Assalamu alaikum, Zafar Sam. Sub Kushari? 
Zafar Muradabadi is a poet and translator, and he used to teach me Urdu. We're going to go and sample a typical old Delhi breakfast. You see that pot over there? It's kind of built into the ground, and so it's cooked overnight in Nehari. And so we put, sprinkle a little bit of lemon on, but they're like green chilies and ginger, and it's very, very hot. Zafar Sahib, when did you come to the old city? In which year did you come to the old city? In 1967. In 1967. So, at that time, your age was 17 years old? Yes, 16 years old. आपने जब अदबी काम शुरू किया तो चांदनी चौक कैसे दिखता था उस वक्त घोड़े तांगे चलते थे कोई बीच में डिवाइडर नहीं था चारों दोनों साइड में पेड़ थे तो ये नुकसान कब होने लगा पापुलेशन बढ़ी तो लोग यहाँ के लोग जो हैं कहीं बाहर जाना पसंद नहीं करते थे वो उसी में फ्लोर डालते गए चार-चार मंदिरें ये बन इमारतें बन गईं लोगों ने अपनी दुकानें आगे को बढ़ानी शुरू कर दी जो सड़क की जगह थी वो अपनी दुकानों में ले ली ये जो अदबी मामला है इसका नुकसान जैसे उर्दू की जो तहजीब थी तो वो कब कम होने लगी और इसकी वजह क्या है पहले बाकायदा यहाँ पर जगह जगह मुशायरे होते थे योम गाली मनाया जाता था योम बेखुद मनाया जाता था और योम दाग मनाया जाता था पैसा उनका कम होते चला गया लोग उसको ताबून करना लोगों ने बंद कर दिया तो इधरे तो उर्दू के खत्म हो गए तो इस तबाई की वजह क्या है उर्दू की रीडरशिप सबसे पहले तो डिटेशनल लैंग्वेज जो है वो हिंदी बना दी गई उर्दू के लिए कोई काम नहीं हुआ यहाँ पर उर्दू के लिए रोजगार खत्म हो गए तो आहिस्ता आहिस्ता लोग जो � What caused the decline was that after partition, Urdu became sort of the language of Pakistan and Hindi became the language here. And people started to be, to, to draw away from, uh, from Urdu. Be it language, population, or even food, change has been in the air in India from the start of the 20th century. In 1906, the All India Muslim League was established. Its eventual aim was to press for political independence for Muslims. And among Hindus, there was a growing self-questioning following centuries of Mughal and British rule. By the 1920s, a Hindu cultural organization, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, or the RSS, emerged. Its aim was to promote Hindu culture and identity. Dr. Hedgevar, who started RSS, he thought what is the cause of our slavery for the last 400 years and so? He thought, he immediately found that lack of patriotism and lack of character, it was the main cause. The RSS went on to become the world's biggest civil society organization. It's also seen by many as a far-right nationalist paramilitary group since independence, it's been banned three times. It's widely accepted that the BJP and Hindu nationalist politics, or Hindutva, emanate from the RSS. Well, Hindutva uh, is actually reducing the great philosophical majesty uh, of, of the Hindu faith into something more like the team identity of the British football hooligan. It's uh, Hindus as a social identity, my team is better than the other guy's team, and if the other guy challenges that, we'll hit him on the head. Indian nationalists, so-called, are saying that there is a territory called India, and our constitution and our nationhood is for everyone on it. Wrong, say the Hindutva acolytes. A territory doesn't make a nation. A people make a nation. 
and the people of the Indian nation are the Hindu people. Therefore, India must be a Hindu Rashtra, a nation of, for, and by the Hindus. And everybody who's not a Hindu can only be here as a guest or an interloper. Uh, that's essentially the choice available to non-Hindus. This conversation about what India is was at the core of the debates of the independence movement in the mid-20th century. This was the scene in Karachi at the meeting of the Constituent Assembly. Should an independent India be secular or divided into two states, Hindu and Muslim? This latter was referred to as the two-nation theory. In the end, independence from Britain led to the creation of two separate countries, India and Pakistan. Later, accompanied by Lady Mountbatten, the Viceroy came to launch the Dominion of Pakistan. One set of people saying that religion should be the determinant of nationhood, that was the idea of Pakistan, and they created a country for India's Muslims on the basis that their religion determined their nationhood, uh, whereas the other set of people said, no, religion cannot determine our nationhood. We have fought for the rights of everybody, and we're going to create a free country for everybody. Right from the very start, that foundational difference defined the difference between the idea of India and the idea of Pakistan. And the idea of India I'm describing has been followed by every other political party in the last 70 years, bar the BJP and its ally, the Shiv Sena. The ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJP, was born in the 1980s, and its Hindutva, or Hindu nationalist politics, sees six Jains and Buddhists as being Indian religions, but considers Islam and Christianity as invaders from outside. This brand of identity politics has seen it rise steadily to power, a rise that has come at the expense of Muslims and others. The BJP has actually brazenly said, we don't, you know, we, we don't care. We will not put up a single Muslim candidate uh, anywhere in the country, and we will still come to power with a, with, with, a, with a significant majority. And they've succeeded in doing that. And it is this social and political construction of the Muslim as the enemy and the other, the enemy within, which has been their, 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 their greatest political success. But it, it, it destroys the very idea of India for which uh, Mahatma Gandhi and others fought because the idea of India centrally was this would be a country where it would not matter which god you worship or if you worship no god, you would be a fully equal citizen. Lucknow, the capital city of the state of Uttar Pradesh. I'm here at a BJP rally. It's about one of the party's favorite subjects, the disputed territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The name on the banner is that of Sham Prasad Mukherjee, a hero of India's independence movement and the founder of a party that later became part of the BJP. Kashmir has been a flashpoint between India and Pakistan since partition. When the two countries broke free of British rule in 1947, the Muslim majority state of Jammu and Kashmir was left in limbo. Its Hindu Maharaja ruler favored ascension to India rather than joining with Pakistan. The conflict that ensued between both countries ended in 1948. The state was divided between the two nations and a UN resolution called for a plebiscite for the people of Kashmir to decide on which nation to join. The plebiscite never took place and both countries still lay claim to the whole of Jammu and Kashmir, fighting wars and regular skirmishes to this day. Kashmir formally acceded to India and was given special status and autonomy in an act known as Article 370, something which the BJP has a long-standing desire to remove.
5th of August, 2019. The special status of Kashmir is revoked, its statehood abolished, and all Indian laws come into force across the Indian part of the state. Kashmir goes into lockdown with a media and telecommunications blackout. Prominent politicians, such as former Chief Minister Mehbooba Mufti, are placed under house arrest. The lockdown in Kashmir means we can't be there to film, but I've secured an exclusive interview with her. She's managed to get use of a phone and is on a social media messaging app. This place has been transformed into an open-air prison. So I feel that, you know, they have further alienated the Kashmiris. The future is very bleak, not only for JNK, but for the whole country, for the whole subcontinent. Mehbubaji, how will the people of Kashmir respond? Well, this is not only going to alienate Indian Muslims further, it's also going to terrorize them and serve them as a warning that every Indian Muslim, you know, he has to fall in line. Otherwise, he'll be stripped of whatever dignity he has, you know, been left with. And uh, they have already started the process of reducing Indian Muslims to second-class citizens. And what does it mean for Kashmir now? We, the people of Kashmir, you know, our leadership who had aligned with India with great hope and rejected two-nation theory, it seems that, you know, we were wrong in choosing India over Pakistan. Kashmir is India's only Muslim-majority state. It joined the Indian Union in 1947 by an instrument of accession which gave it a special status. Today, in the building behind us, the Parliament of India, that special status is being undone. I want Republican Party of India and I want to give the Prime Minister of the country to the Prime Minister of the country who has removed the Dara 370 and has done a very good job. He should do it in 2014, but he did it. We do it with him. We will open the factories from there. We will get the people to get the work. We will get the work. That's why we will do it with Narendra Modi Ji. श्री अमित शाह जी का धन्यवाद करते हैं। We have here a largely pliant media that will support that news because as far as Prime Minister Narendra Modi goes, he has thrown red meat to his base, which will help him electorally. But as far as Kashmir goes, its special status is abolished, and today India moves one step closer to becoming a purely Hindu nation. In the next episode, I delve deeper into Hindutva and ask, what do the next generation make of it all? Madam, we have a good place for our shahidu. We have a good place for our shahidu. We have a good place for our shahidu. We have a good place for our shahidu.